kind of was a little side project. It's uh, possibly a useless side pro project, but maybe it has some, some usefulness to some people. Um, and it's on the utility of simple morphometrics in a high dimensional biological world, which is kind of a little bit of an over the title, but title nonetheless. So, you know, just starting off, if I showed you this piece of tissue or if I showed a bunch of different researchers this piece of tissue based on their frame of reference or what kind of research they do, they tell me a bunch of different ways I can extract information from this, 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 this image, right? Maybe if I talk to a pathologist, they'd say, okay, maybe there's some stroma, some immune cells, some epithelial cells, some glands, some ductal structures off to the right. If I talk to someone in quantitative bioimaging, they maybe load up cell profile and give me a big vector of data, maybe some texture features. If I talk to a, someone who did multiplex imaging, they maybe give me, ask me what tissue, give me a panel, I get a spatial molecular map of proteins. Or if I talk to, or maybe at the end of the day, if I wanted to train like a neural net, I take some histology, get some big vision transformer and pre-train it and get some low dimensional representation that I compare against all the other tissue in my biobank. And those are wonderful questions, very interesting things to do. And I'm very interested in all of them, but uh, I'm not gonna talk about any of that. I'm just gonna talk about this. And what this is, is just shape and size. Um, and you might ask, okay, well, I just talked about all this rich information that's in this in this tissue. Why do I care about just shape and size? And why do I care about morphometrics, which is the study of shape and size? And, you know, there's a few reasons. Obviously, one is that shape and size is a fundamental cellular property. So it's a question in and of itself. And, you know, shape and size varies with the disease, of course, varies along differentiation axes. You know, you have whole genome duplication, you get changes in nuclei. So it's an independent question. Um, you know, it often represents the most cheap and accessible phenotypic readout from images. So very easy. If you have a segmentation model, you can get shape and size. It's immune to batch effects. Really, if you have a segmentation model that's trained with a lot of data, data augmentation in your domain, it's going to be a robust variation. And so you can get it across any sample. And then, you know, it's a simple baseline for building more complex models, right? If you can't be shape and size in terms of predictive modeling, then maybe you need to think about, think about your model. And so the really kind of why I wanted to do morphometrics is I just wanted to look at spatial data. I wanted to get a simple readout of, of shape and size, but I found it was really kind of laborious to go from image to shape and size. Um, in, in, in reality, like this would be nice. I had three lines of code. I'd go from images, get extract, you know, my shapes and do some sort of morphometrics on, on that data. Um, but that's kind of not the case. And, and, you know, in a world of existing tools, if you do kind of quantitative bioimaging, you know, why do we need another toolkit for morphometrics? Um, one of the first reasons that a lot of existing tools are usually one-off scripts. They have like minimal or single-use functionality and often broken code bases, bad documentation, not reproducible. I mean, there is gold standard software, but usually they have like a GUI first kind of experience. And usually they're built for microscopy or screen experience where you have like very large N and not really big spatial images. And then finally, the last thing is there's really no morphometric methods or tools that uh, naturally integrate into the existing single cell or spatial ecosystem. And so this talk, the rest of the talk is about a toolkit for automated morph morphometrics from bioimages. And the premise is really simple on how it works, right? You have some, okay, well, I guess you lost some color here. You have some biological images. Uh, you do some segmentation. This is supposed to be colored, uh, but it's not colored. Um, and essentially get some, some, some instances of your nuclear cells. Do some pre-processing. So you get shape outlines. You got to do pre-processing, right? Because if I have a generative model of shape and size, if I have rotation or translation, it's going to confound my analyses. And then once you have this, you can compute simple things like cell profile does like geometric descriptors, or you can do something a little more sophisticated, which is really not that sophisticated. It's like learn a generative model of your shape through your low dimensions, and you can do stuff with the reconstructions. Um, and so basically this toolkit we made basically abstracts all this process. So if you have data from anywhere in this kind of pipeline, you can, you can, you can run it, right? And to make it simple with spatial data, uh, we just kind of hack this existing structure if you use Python, whatever, and data, which is like a, a, a data structure for storing uh, gene expression. Uh, and we just hacked it so you can add shape and imaging data straight into it so everything can kind of be contained together. So what can you do with shape and size, right? Uh, I'm saying you can do a lot with it. Um, first off, it's a QC for segmentation data. So say you segmented some arbitrary biomage to spatial data. You can use it for QC. You can use stuff like single cell and supervised morphometrics. You can build a predictive model using it. More interesting stuff is probably starting to connect gene expression to biological form and also spatial morphometrics. So that's basically the premise of the, of the tool. Um, and given I don't have a lot of time, I'm only going to talk about one possibly useful use case for morphometrics, and that is in situ sequencing, where you have gene expression and segmentation data for a single cell. 
Um, and if you play around with, you know, in situ sequencing data, this is kind of one of the canonical examples that's available, which is like a breast adenocarcinoma uh, by Henrix Xenium. And so you have some uh, invasive tumor in green, some ductal carcinoma in situ in, in pink. And, you know, the classic thing is now you have cell types, you, you have your hemaps, you have some coarse grain um, cell types, epithelial stroma, immune malignant. You can be, do something naive and take these outlines and, and do something like UMAP. And if you do some bootstrapping to see how well you can predict cell type from shape outlines, you get something like 75% accuracy. But this is not all that interesting for morphometrics. What is more interesting is starting to try to define morphometric profiles. And I really hope all that color is not gone in the next image, but basically you can take your shape outlines, fit some generative model. You have some late dimension. If you standard scale, everything at zero, it's gonna be your mode shape. And if you interpolate along a given late dimension, you get kind of your mode, mode shapes. And okay, it's not broken. And so essentially, if you say something as simple as PCA, you get a bunch of different axes of, of variation uh, that kind of give you a visual phenotypic output of your of your spatial data. So for example, a lot of this is explained by size. Uh, you know, the stromal cell is driving most of the variation. And actually it's probably because there's some systematic biases in the way Xenium does it segmentation right now. Um, when you have kind of expectation on what you see with a tumor, you get increased uh, nuclear cellular area ratio, and then some stuff on the bottom, which is mostly just like stuff to do with tissue structure, like tilt, fairness, et cetera. Uh, you can also ask questions like how it varies in space. I'm not gonna get too much into this, but you can compare major versus di dispersed uh, invasive or malignant cells. You can look at how things vary from the tumor edge. Um, maybe a better idea would use build like a spatial uh, neighbor graph because, you know, if you have mixture of stroma and say immune cells, you probably want to look at the fraction of neighbors and not some naive distance from the major primary block. You can also, this wouldn't be a spatial, you know, slide if I didn't show you, you could do autocorrelation with uh, morphometric uh, descriptors and stuff. And then finally, more interesting things, you could kind of maybe take some naively some stuff from ecology where you compare, say, the correlated gene expression between, or how much variation is explained by it, morphometric variation and in terms of genes, like redundancy analysis. Um, and you know, you get something like, so what we did here is actually, is we took the gene expression, computed factors first, so we didn't have to worry too much about dropout. And then what you get out is something like this. You know, you have your factors, which is just a, a representation of your gene expression. The arrows are being your morphometric descriptors. So if you have a factor and an arrow that are have a close angle, they're very correlated. And you you capture things you'd expect, right? Uh, nuclear size, these are nuclear size uh, uh, descriptors, really correlates with your malignant signature. And so that's kind of what you can do with like uh, a lot of this in situ sequencing. There's more, more you can do. But uh, for now, that's what you can do. Uh, there's obviously limitations and comments such as, you know, morphometric analysis is only going to be as good as your segmentation model. For example, Xenium uses like a nuclei expansion algorithm to their segmentation. So things that don't really have neighbors might have a higher probability of just having a large cell size just by uh, definition of the algorithm. Um, if you want to connect gene expression to morphometrics, uh, it's important to realize you're kind of constrained by the panel, set, the panel selection, right? Most of these panels are selected for cell typing. Um, so if you really want to enrich this kind of analysis, you're obviously going to consider covariates and you're going to want to consider maybe mapping on your single cell data onto your spatial data so you get more uh, richer uh, gene expression information. Um, and then at worst, this tool really is a QC for segmentation data. At best, maybe you can extract some biological insights depending on your data set composition. And really, like I said before, it's only one aspect of, of morphology. So there's many more ways to analyze. If you have a context where you don't have a lot of subcellular variation, then it's, you know, taking an over-parameterized neural network doesn't really add much benefit. But if you have like a lot of subcellular structure, that's where you start getting more benefit from these nonlinear models. Although this is probably not a fair comparison because if you're segmenting the cell and then comparing it, so you probably want to take into account the uh, subcellular uh, morphometric profiles as well when you benchmark these. Uh, and so the software is done and you can run this in a few lines of code on your spatial data or any arbitrary bioimaging. Uh, I'm just going to finish up the preprint and submit it. And thank you to my PI, Philip Adala, everyone in the lab, especially Yaren, who we've been talking a lot about morphology with. So thank you.